So many people pray the prayer, Lord, I want to live a life for you. And yet internally they think or sometimes even say out loud, but Lord, how could you possibly use me? We're quick to look at others and see all the positives, all the strengths, all the, the great talents and gifts that God has placed in their life. And we understand how God could use them. But I'm so encouraged that through scripture and in personal experience, God is able to do completely the opposite sometimes of what we expect. Today, I wanna to encourage you as we hear from Pastor Peter, he's gonna be sharing around how God can choose the foolish to confound the wise. And as you listen, I know you'll be encouraged that regardless of your background, regardless of how you think about yourself, if you would yield yourself to God, He's able to do incredible things through every single one of our lives. I want to give you a little bit of a word for 2023. I'm, I'm sensing uh, that you can expect this year to be the year of the unusual and the year of the unexpected. I said the year of the unusual and the year of the unexpected. Now I know we all want to live a life of pleasure and leisure and comfortable and everything go well. But you know, when you look at what's happening on the planet today and we get caught up in so much of the stuff, but my reason to say unusual and unexpected is because God's got a timetable and He normally does things that are unusual and unexpected, amen? And can I even say this for the young people? God does things that are uncool. What I mean by that? Well, I'll tell you right now, He's not going along with the present culture of the world, right? And so sometimes you can seem uncool if you're not going along with the present culture of this world. The culture of this world is going in the opposite direction to what this Word preaches and teaches. Can I hear an amen to that? And so you've got to remember, my friend, that God is unwavering. Everything else may change, but He never does. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. So He's unwavering, but He's also understanding. Hallelujah. He's also upright. Upright. He's also, hallelujah, full of goodness and full of truth. You know, Paul spoke that God, when, you, when He visited heaven, He said it was unspeakable. But I wanna tell you, my friend, there's an unconditional love that comes from heaven to every human being on the planet right now as we're living still in the days of grace. Can I hear an amen to that? So God is still united. If you get all these uns, unusual, unexpected, you know, you know, but He's still united in His mission and purpose for this planet. And that is to reach out with His love to save every person that is willing to believe on Him. Can I hear an amen to that? You're gonna help me this morning, aren't you? One of the crazy things is that God throughout Scripture, as you read the Bible, seems to have a soft spot for the underdog. Now I want you to hear me today. God, it seems to have a soft spot for the misplaced person, for the struggling person, for the downtrodden person, for the down and out person, for the leper, for the orphan, for the widow, for those who are locked up even, for all those who think they don't have a lot to offer this world. God seems to have a soft spot. Those who acknowledge that they're a sinner. Just like the woman that Pastor Greg spoke so well last week who was caught in adultery, right? But whether it's from Abraham to Moses to David to Jeremiah, those that the world looked down upon and even despised like Joseph, who didn't have a lot going for them like Jabez. Jabez's name means pain. If you know anything about your Bible and blind Bartimaeus, his name was just son of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. He didn't have his own name. But on the other hand, it seems that God does not have a lot of time for the boastful, for the arrogant, for the prideful, for those who think that they can live in this life without Him. I hear that the late Pope said this, that he fears for a world that think that they can live without God. And today we have politicians around the world who are boastful, who are arrogant, who think that they can govern without God. Take the Bible out of Parliament, take the Bible out of schools, take prayer out. I mean, even Mr. Fauci, you know, says, you cannot question me for I am science. Hello. I mean, the boastful and the arrogant, God does not seem to have a lot of time for, but He gives grace to the humble. Last week, I mentioned the Apostle Paul. He was a man, of course, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, arguably the greatest saint that has ever lived on earth. 
And you can read about his earthly credentials. Have a look at them. In Philippians, he writes in chapter 3, verse 4, If anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So here he is talking about his credentials in the flesh. And there's a reason for it. Circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, there's a big deal back then. Not so much today, right? Of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuted the church, concerning the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. What things were gained to me, these things I've counted for Christ, lust for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things that I may gain, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. So I mentioned last week, just in, in a couple of minutes, that Paul wrote at the beginning of his ministry in Corinthians, I, Paul, least of all the apostles. Now the apostles were pretty big dudes, right? But he put himself at the bottom of the pack, even though he wrote most of the New Testament. Halfway through his ministry, he writes, I, Paul, am least of all the saints. So he's dropped from the apostles now to all the saints. And then he writes, at the end of his ministry in Timothy, I, Paul, am the chief of all sinners. So Paul wasn't becoming more boastful and arrogant. He was becoming more humble, if I put it that way. The more that he got to know God, the more he realised he was utterly dependent upon God. The Apostle Paul obviously had a deep and revelatory understanding, awareness of his need for God call himself the chief of sinners. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul, the chief of all sinners. You know, I find Christians have a conscious awareness, a conscious dependence of God. We wake up and we know that we are only standing by the grace and the goodness of God. But just because we are the only ones conscious of it doesn't mean that other people don't depend on Him as well. I would go as far to say that every single person only gets to stand by the common grace of God. They only get to wake up on a planet which is still spinning by the goodness and the sovereignty of God. They only get to enjoy the food that grows in the ground because God causes the rain and causes the growth and the increase. Every single one of us depend on Him. My prayer for every single person is that you would never let pride cloud your ability to see that every single one of us, regardless of how long we've walked with God, regardless of the difference He's made in our life, every single one of us, every single day, we need God in everything. In fact, when others were boasting of their credentials, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now listen now, because I know we just like a nice life and we pray for a nice life. We pray for good weather. We pray for, you know, a comfortable bed. We pray for this. But here's Paul saying, in labours more abundant and stripes above measure. In stripes, that's getting flogged. In prisons more frequently. In deaths more often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. The night and day I've been in the deep in journeys, often in perils of water and perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides my other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, Paul says, I will boast in the things which concern my weakness. You know, most people have a resume. In your resume, you never put your weak things, do you? You just put the good things that people want to hear about you. But Paul had a secret. Paul had this understanding. He knew that if God wanted to, then God can use a donkey. Have you read your Bible? God can use a donkey to speak to people. He does not need the riches and the cleverness of man. In fact, He often chooses the foolish to confound the wise. I said He often chooses the foolish to confound the wise. Now listen, if you're intelligent today, and most of us are, or if you've got something going for you with some great skill and talent, don't feel left out. I'll get to that. But you know, in Judges chapter 3, and this is what helped me build this message this morning, where God will choose the foolish 
If you're feeling you haven't got a lot to offer, I've got good news for you today. Somebody should say amen. I'll say amen to that. This part of the Bible in Judges 3, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Anybody say a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now when Ehud made himself a dagger, it was a double-edged and cubit in length and fastened under his clothes on his right thigh and he brought tribute. And if you know the story, he kills the king who was suppressing or oppressing Israel. But he was, listen now, from the tribe of Benjamin. Why do I say that? Benjamin, Benjamin, the name Benjamin means the son of my right hand the son of my right hand. In other words, Ehud was a lefty, a left-handed man from a right-handed tribe. So he was a misfit. He was a bit unusual. He may have been scorned even as a kid, you know, and picked on because he was left-handed, right? He's supposed to be of the right-handed tribe. And so he may not even be accepted, but God says, I can use this man because they checked for the dagger on the right, on the the other side, and they didn't check it on 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 the side that he had the dagger. So God uses the unusual, the foolish to confound the wise so often. So don't think that God cannot use you, my friend, in 2023. Now, whether it was Moses, Moses said, Lord, who am I? Who am I? I can't speak well. Who am I, Lord? God replies, God replies to Moses, just like He'd reply to you today. Listen, Moses, listen, person. It's not who you are, it's who I am. I am Yahweh, the great I am. Like Christa said, He is a provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. Gideon said, Lord, I am the least of the least, the least of the least tribes, right? And God takes him and he gets 32,000 men. God said, that's too many. He whittles it down to 10,000, that's too many. He whittles it down to 300 to come against the Midianites of 52,000. Take Deborah. Deborah, if you know the story, she was a woman living in a man's world at the time. Barak was the commander of the army. But Deborah rose up and uh, you may know the story, I won't have time to go into it, but David, even his own father overlooked him. He brought all his other sons. David was left out in the sheepfold. Even his father forgot about him. Jeremiah says, but I'm a youth. Who am I? I am but a youth. The list goes on. But not only Old Testament saints were on the list of the unlikely. They were not the ones that the world would choose. I understand that. But just as we heard recently over Christmas, Jesus was born in a stable, a most unlikely place for a king to be born, let alone the Son of God. God chose what seemed foolish to man. You think a king would be born in a palace. He was raised in Nazareth. God chose Nazareth. Nazareth was a nowhere town. You know what Nathaniel said? Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a saying of the day. And then then Jesus calls 12 disciples. Now, if you had to pick 12 guys to change the world, I know where you'd go. You'd go to the university. You'd go to the millionaires club or the billionaires club. You'd, You'd go to the politicians of the day. You'd go to the most famous. You'd go to Hollywood. You'd go, you know, can I just say, young people, listen to me now. Don't get too caught up when a celebrity comes to Jesus. You can rejoice in it, but so many people get so caught up when a film star or, 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 or a singer or something comes to Christ. But you know, and I know that often the pressures of life for them are so high and then they may fall away or something may happen and, and it's tragic. But so often people idolise other people. We're not called to idolise other people. You can rejoice in their salvation, But don't go around bragging about them. Brag about what God's done in your life. Hallelujah. Because your life is just as important as that person. I've met so many people that God has made a huge difference in their life. I stand here today as a testimony of God's faithfulness. I, I look at how my life was when God met me and I look at the difference He's made in the years I've walked with Him. And I will never stand here and say, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished. Instead, I will boast in the Lord, like the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. I boast in the Lord because He is the one who makes the difference. 
And if you look around the world today, there are millions, billions of Christians who can testify of the same thing, that God is faithful, that God is good, that God is patient, that He is merciful, and that He is able to lead us from where we are, even the most broken of circumstances and situations, and lead us to a place of wholeness, of righteousness, and of blessing. I don't know about you, but when I think about the goodness of God, I will never brag about myself. I only ever want to boast about the Lord. When I grew up in Germany, I had a lot of pressure from my parents to become a doctor or a pilot and all that thing and studying, and, and, but I hated school and started from young age to be quite rebellious. Well, I started to burgle, you know, to break into cars, to break into houses and, uh, and doing all the wrong stuff in my life. I was on the run from the police. I went to Amsterdam and hide it wherever I could. Through all of that, you know, I came more and more in contact with uh, with the Moroccans, you know, and with uh, with a whole, you can say, mafia. Everything was out of order in my life, and then it just came in my mind and said, "Hey, God, if you're really out there, so, 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 so help me!" And suddenly, I saw from far a person. You know, I thought, "I know this guy. This guy was the only real Christian I, I ever knew in my whole life." So I rushed to him and said, "Hey, what are you doing here?" You know, and and he said, "What's up with you, Stefan? I haven't seen you for a long time." And so, uh, and I said, "Yeah, hey, I'm actually uh, the police has a warrant on me." And he was like, "What the heck? You know, what what happened with your life?" And I told him everything. You know, and then my heart changed, you know, and a hope came in my heart. I prayed again and said, God, if you help me now in that situation, I really believe in you. And I, I go to the police and I go to jail and you can have my life. So I went on in the prison to stay as a Christian, you know, learn more about the Bible. Lord, as a Christian guy came, visited me, brought me a lot of books and so on. And suddenly after, after a couple of weeks, the door opened and one of the guys who looked after us said, yeah, here's the phone, it's the persecutor of the court. And he said, I had to read all your letters you wrote with this slaughter. And he was so touched by it that he said, do you know what? I believe you will not run away again. I let you go today. But then it got really bad with me. I really forgot completely about what God did in my life. I backslided. So I thought, oh, I get in contact with my old uh, mates, you know, from the mafia. And they would give me the drugs. I didn't have to pay for it. I sold it first and brought some money now. And it became also to the point where they said they offered me to go with them to Morocco and do a 200 kilo deal. So we went to Morocco. One morning I got up and thought, man, where are you going now? You know, what have you done? You know, a year or so ago you were a Christian, you know, and, and now you're here and, and, and you're an organized crime, you know, and it's, it's not a game anymore. You get up being killed maybe, you know. I, 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 I just tried to run away, you know. Say, uh, the Americans searched everywhere for me, but I made it at the end uh, out of the country, made it back to Germany. So I was kind of hiding out there and still afraid of that the mafia could come anytime and, and bashes me up again. Uh, and I decided to contact with Loda again. So I really want to change my life again, you know. So he said, yeah, come on, sit down, I pray for you. So he laid hands on me, you know, put it on my neck, shoulder here. And, and after the prayer, you know, I just find, found myself really peaceful. I thought, yes, yeah, that's it. And then later on, Loda had to leave, you know. A couple of minutes later, uh, it knocked again on my door, you know. So I thought, oh, who is that? And looked out of the window and it was my old friend, Carl. And he was a part of the whole uh, criminal organization there. And I thought, yeah, come in, we chatted and so, you know. And all of a sudden it rang again. And I thought, uh, what's going on? But before I had, could walk to the door, Carl was running to the door and opened it quickly, you know. And in came the mafia, you know, three of the guys, you know, walked in. And, and all say, you know, say that now we're bashing you up, man. Now we're getting you, you know, and cursed at me, you know. And, and Greg took a big uh, a butcher's knife, what I had in my kitchen, you know, and, and pulled it, you know, and came to me. Now you're done, man. And I walked backwards, you know, and my legs fell against the couch, you know, and I fell exactly in the place Loda just 
prayed for me, you know. And I still, I could feel a heat, you know, exactly where he had his hand on me, you know. And Greg looked at me with a knife cut up and said, I kill you, you sucker! And, so I, and threw it on the table and the knife broke, you know. And he was like, I will get you. And turned around and they all walked out, you know. And I was like sitting in there, man, what just happened here, you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't believe it, you know, when I still felt that prayer, you know, I thought back on, on, on Lora's prayer where he asked for protection, you know, and, and, and for God's blessing, I thought God really protected me there, you know. When that knife broke, it was like, devil, your, your, your power is broken, you know, you have no power over me, you know, you don't, you know. And so I knew I, I want this Jesus, you know, and, and that's now, that's it for me. And I never will go back anymore. And, and I never did it. From that on, I, I walked with, uh, with, with Christ and, and sure, I had my struggles, you know, and God did a lot of miracles and I never could have imagined what, what God would do in my future, yeah. What amazes me most is how graceful God is, how merciful He is and that He always gives you another chance, not one chance, not two chances. Many speak about a second chance. Now God gives you a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth one. He really loves us, you know, and yeah, that's my story. But my challenge to you in 2023 is, would you make yourself available for God to use this year? Even though you may think you don't have a lot going for you, even though you may think, well, what have I got to offer? Can I just say this? It is more than likely that God has chosen you because there's something that only you can do and somebody that only you can reach. Even if you think that you haven't got a lot going for you, I believe God wants to use you. I want you to believe for the unexpected and the unusual. Don't be like Moses and say, God, send somebody else. Be like Isaiah and say, Lord, send me. So let's all get to the higher ground. That's my thought this morning. Let's all get to the higher ground because I'm not being negative in the new year, I'm just being real. You're not stupid, you know, the tide of this world is coming in fast. I, I don't wanna be an ostrich and bury my head in the sand. I don't want to be swept away by the tide of this world. I don't wanna get caught up in the culture of the day. I wanna get caught up in Jesus, even if I'm the last one here and I know I won't be, but He's the rock of all ages. And the way to be safe is not to think how good and strong and how smart you are. The way to be safe is to humble yourself and to acknowledge your need of Him, to recognise how good and how strong He is. He is in control, even though this world is unravelling and it may not sound like a Happy New Year's message, but you know and I know that's a reality. But even though there's things out there that you and I, we just kind of put our hands up and say, what can we do? It's too big for us, I don't wanna know. But friend, I wanna encourage you this morning, no matter what's happening out there, understand that God is still on the throne. He is in command of this universe. He calls out the stars one by one. He knows the hair upon your head, hallelujah. He knows you're sitting down and you're standing up. And I know that He will be with you and bless you. He's blessed my life so much and I thank God for the good things. But Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Apostle Paul, as you know, in the midnight hour in prison was rejoicing in the Lord. And so even when things don't go exactly the way you want, you know, I got a punch in my car. Isn't it a pain? You can get so upset over the smallest things in life. But friend, can I encourage you this morning to trust in the Lord with all your heart. He is coming again. And there's things that will happen on the planet before He does, but He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So humble yourself while you can. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time. As Chris has said before, sometimes it takes a couple of years. We're not good at patience, are we? We just like faith, but it's faith and patience. So I want you to believe God this year. I want you to be in faith this year, but I wanna encourage you, my friend, don't be prideful, don't be boastful, don't be arrogant. Don't think you, can, you know more than God. Trust in Him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Man, Bev so often says, oh, I just wish I had a magic wand to, you know, to make it right for everybody. But you know, Paul, and I don't wanna get into it too much, but he learned character through what he went through. 
You don't learn how to sail on a smooth sea. You've heard me say that so many times. So my friend, can I just encourage you to understand the hour in which you and I are living and to be part of His coming Kingdom, to be ready to be taken at the time the trumpet sounds. Whether it's this year or next year, I just want you to live for the unexpected and the unusual. And don't get caught up in the cool things of the world. Are you with me today? I'm so encouraged that regardless of our perceived shortcomings in the hands of God, our life is able to be molded into something beautiful, something which brings Him glory, something which can be used to show the goodness, the power and the reality of our God. So much of it relies on the way we approach God. The Bible tells us that He resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Humility is an incredible thing and it's an incredible way to approach our life in approaching God and living with Him. It takes humility for us to acknowledge our need of Him as a Saviour in the first place. Perhaps there's someone watching who isn't right with God. And today you would take the opportunity to humble yourself and say, Lord, I need you. The Bible says if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and He raised from the dead, you will know what it is to be saved, to be redeemed, to be forgiven, to be reconciled back in relationship with God. You can place your hope in Him by praying a prayer something like this. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me with an everlasting love. Today, I turn from my sin and I place my hope in you, receiving you as Lord and Saviour. All my days, I will live for you and walk with you. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time or as a recommitment, congratulations. You now know what it is to place your life into the hands of a master potter, one who is able to take whatever the clay of your life looks like and shape it into something incredible, something with a great purpose and something with great fruitfulness. I encourage you, continue to pursue God, continue to acknowledge your need of Him, continue to stay humble. And as you do, as you walk and talk with Him, I know you'll know what it's like to have Him impact your life. Yeah.